Good morning. Aha, this is working. I'm sorry that we're starting just a little bit late, but as the realtor said when they came in, they have their own little method of time, and <laughs> we're getting there. We actually left one behind, so uh, well, I'm going to try to make introductions here real quick. First of all, I'm Trina Philo, and I'm the relocation assistant specialist um, or manager, and um, we have a partnership, a sponsorship with Berkshire, Hath Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, they used to be Prudential and um, really, the, if anybody remembers the good old days, <laughs> eight months ago, yes. <laughs> um, and so I'm still stuttering over their name. Um, we have with us today Tom Jangula. He's the manager. B.J. Etheridge. Um, they're not in order here. So Kathy Smolinski. Coming, oh, excuse me, and uh, the new one here is Sally Bulgalaria. <laughs> I'm pretty close. <laughs> um, and then with stage right home staging, we have Carol Morgan, kind of wave your hand. And she brought an assistant with her, Patricia Hayes, who's just going to be a, an observer over there. So the first thing on the agenda is make sure you have your cell phones off, please. Um, and then what we're going to do is they're going to get up and talk their presentation, and if you have questions, do you want them to hold them or ask as we go? And if you have questions, please raise your hand, and we'll get a mic to you. Um, so, Tom, are you the first one up then? All righty. So here is Tom. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry for our brief delay here, and this is a little awkward. Um, as Trina said, my name is Tom Jangle. I manage two offices for our company, uh, the location here in Battle Creek, and also a location in Marshall, Michigan. Uh, we are part of a 40-group office uh, with offices throughout most of Michigan as well as northern Indiana and approximately uh, 600 real estate agents through that area. So uh, whether you're here or uh, throughout most of the state, we have an opportunity to help service you. Uh, I know that Carol Morgan and her group also cover uh, a large part of the state and would also be able to service in those areas. A few points that we're going to cover today uh, as part of prepping your home for sale. The first area is going to be uh, financial considerations. Uh, we're going to move from there to uh, making determinations on uh, using an agent versus attempting to sell the home yourself. Talk about some things that you might want to do on the exterior of your home to prep it for sale, uh, the interior of your home and then also uh, actually talk more specifically about staging. I uh, do encourage you as we go along to ask questions if something comes up, but we do have some time structured in at the end for Q&A as well. And with that, I am going to hand it over to BJ Etheridge, and um, thank you so much. Okay, again, my name is BJ Etheridge. I thank everybody for coming today. One of the first big questions you wanna ask yourself, are you able to sell your house? So you need to know, of course, how much you owe on the house, uh, a lot of people, when I meet with them, they think they know what they owe. Uh, they might tell me they owe $100,000, and then when we get to the title search, uh, uh, find out they owe $120,000, which, of course, would make a big difference uh, on any property you might make. So you want to make sure you know where you are financially, what you owe on the house, um, and then, again, what your house value is. There's several ways to determine house value. One of the best ways, of course, is to contact a realtor. Uh, he's going to run a market analysis for you, find out what's going on in the neighborhood, what houses it's sold for, what the competition has their houses listed for, and that'll give you a pretty good idea. Uh, the other thing we look at, of course, is um, uh, what you paid for your house originally and how long you've been in it. Uh, we'll do a study on how the market's performed over several years to tell you, as you know, the market didn't do real well for quite a few years, but it is starting to increase, so we, we like seeing that. Uh, there's several resources to determine market value. One of them, and this is a, an old one, is the SEV. That's state equalized value. And typically, we used to say your house is worth double the SEV. So if the SEV is 42, then it should be worth 84. Uh, then we also look at things like condition, uh, location, upgrades that you've done to it, outbuildings, uh, what your neighbor's houses look like. Those sort of things will also affect the value of your house. So again, a realtor is a good resource for that and probably your best because we know the local market. Uh, also, there's an appraised value. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get that a lot of times until the buyer has a lender come over and appraise it. In the old days, the appraisers were over appraising houses. They were just giving money away to everybody and that's pretty much what got the housing market in the bad situation it was in. And now they've swung the other way where they're almost under appraising some houses. So 
we have to be careful of that where we don't want to list it too high because if it doesn't appraise, the buyers can't get the money for the loan to buy the house. Uh, so again, an appraiser ultimately is going to come in and tell you what the lender is going to be willing to loan on that house. And they do the same sort of search market study as we do. So they'll look at the same numbers we do to, to help with that value assessment. There's also other things out there, a lot of online appraisals, a lot of online market studies, Zillow, Trulia, Realtor.com. Uh, the only problem we're finding with them is they're, they're more of a global approach. Um, so they really don't know certain neighborhoods, in, for example, around Battle Creek. They may do a broader study, Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And some of those numbers get skewed sometimes. So again, that's why you want to a lot of times go with a local agent who can tell you more what's going on. Uh, any, any questions on that? Yes, sir. Uh, that's not a bad approach. Uh, there's a cost involved with that, though, so you would have to pay for that. Uh, but that is a good way to approach it. And a lot of times when we have a lender who doesn't appraise it properly, or we, we don't feel they did, then we will look for a separate appraiser. The question was, is it a good idea to get your house appraised before you put it on the market? And that, that is a good approach, and a lot of people are doing that. Uh, it might not be, and, and the payoff amount is also calculated to the day of closing. So that's going to change right up until we know when the closing date is. But it should be pretty accurate, and you can always call your lender any day, and they'll tell you exactly what your payoff should be. That might not be totally correct. Okay. Uh, the next thing we'd like to cover is FISBO options, uh, listing with an agent, or FISBO stands for For Sale by Owner. That's what a FISBO is. Anybody didn't know that. Uh, you want to consider uh, the ability to market your house. 33% of people find their homes through an agent. Uh, another 43% find it through the internet, and I think that might be a little low these days. I think more and more and more and more people are going to the internet. Uh, so if you have your house listed with a an agent like, for example, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, you're on over 1,100 websites, so people are going to find your house. There are some FISBO websites, but again, if they're not looking at that website, they probably won't find your house. Um, also, we get uh, the quality of your presentation is important. Pictures on the internet. If people pull up a house and there's one picture or five pictures, it's, they're, they're ob odds are they're going to pass that up. Uh, we're allowed 24 pictures in our local MLS, and Berkshire Hathaway Home Services post 24 pictures. And we have a professional photographer that just makes the house look fantastic. Uh, and we're the only service in town that uses that, that option. Um, sites used for exposure, I just mentioned that. We're on over 1,100 sites, uh, and you want maximum exposure because everybody's searching all over the place. Nine out of 10 FISBOs end up with an agent. Uh, so again, it's a frustrating thing. We also notice that most FISBOs are overpriced, probably up to 20%. So if you really don't know that what's going on, if you haven't discussed it with an agent, everybody prices their house based on emotion. You love that house, you raised your kids in that house, you put that granite countertop in and you think all of that has value and it might not. Uh, so again, the market study, the, the value is what the market will bear, what a buyer's willing to pay. So it's important to price your house properly and again, an agent can assist you with that. Agents assist home sales average 23% more uh, selling and, and, and for a higher price. So it is important to, to get it priced right. We can also assist you with the paperwork. Most people don't realize the cost of selling a house. I tell most people it, it costs about 10% to sell your house. It's a little less than that. It's maybe nine and a quarter, but 10% is easier math. So you figure your realtor fees, six, 7%. Uh, there's a transfer tax, there's title insurance. There's a few title office fees. Uh, so again, that cost has to be calculated in what your pricing is. And we can help you with that. We can get you through all the title work, paperwork, the listing forms, all the legal documents. We'll do title searches for you. Uh, that's all things you don't think about if you're just putting a for sale by owner sign up there. Also, again, I mentioned the pricing. The price is important. If you don't price it right, the first two weeks is when you get your most activities. And then people start looking past it. So if you're overpriced, you're going to miss those buyers. So we can help with that by pricing it properly for you. Uh, and again, timing's important. Uh, I always ask my clients what's important, selling it at high price or selling it quickly. Well, of course, it's usually a combination of both. So if you price it right, it will sell quickly. Currently, my problem is things are selling too quickly. 
uh, four, five, six, seven days after I list it. So I, I tell people when I list a house, are you ready to move? And boom, it's sold. And, oh, we've got nowhere to go. So uh, if it's priced properly, it's going to sell quickly in this market right now. Inventory is extremely low. And then you can get, we can assist you with financing and the whole process of financing. We work with Kellogg's Community Credit Union in our office, but we also have very good relationships with about every lender in town. Yes, yes, I'm doing a VA loan right now. Of course, VA loans means we're dealing with the government, so they're a little more lengthy. Um, they a few more hoops to jump through. The inspection process is a little, little more detailed, and, and it depends on the the amount of money available in that program. Is there a certain time of year that's best to sell your house in, season wise? Um, everybody thinks that you know the spring's the best time. The problem with that is you also have more competition in the spring because everybody's doing that. I find January 1st people start buying. You might get a little lull through Christmas, but first of the year, New Year's resolution, boy, we're going to go out there and get that house this year. And I've been busy since January. I sell a third of my houses in the winter. Yeah, uh, obviously, if there's going to be more houses on the market, then that's more competition for you. And we have heard that there's some jobs moving. Uh, I don't think it's the panic people fear it is. Um, you know, that's just a shift of a department. I see them, they're going to bring in more research and development people. But there will be more houses on the market. Those typically are a little higher priced houses because those are executive positions or, or administrative positions, a lot of them. And a lot of the Kellogg's people uh, live in Portage. So it's not so much the local market. Going back to your um, statement about timing, um, we are actually, we just broke ground on our house to build, and so we will be um, selling our house. And my husband and I actually disagree. I said, we need to get this house in the market by the end of the summer. And he said, no, if it's priced right, it will, it can sell. And because we'll be moving in um, the end of December, beginning of January. Yep. So what you're telling me is my husband's right? I would, <laughs> I would never say that because I've been married 38 years and I... You know, my wife's always right. Uh, but it, again, it's a combination, it's a balancing act. You kind of have to look at that. It can take six months to a year to build a house. There could be some delays. But also, the sooner you get it out there, the, the more chance you're gonna find that ideal buyer. And you can always delay closing or you can put in the statement that, you know, possession at this time when our house is finished uh, or you get temporary housing. We could okay, um, because in your opinion, your advice would be: Do we get it on the market at the end of the summer, or should we just wait? My advice right now is get it on the market now because inventory is low. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We can't predict again. Let's say at the end of the summer, there's 200 ex Kellogg's employees' houses on the market. Your value has gone down, and there's more competition. Right now is ideal time. Yes. So when you go look at Zillow, and Zillow kind of gives you an idea of what your house might be worth. How accurate is that? Well, again, it, it's not a bad way to start, but it's not going to be as accurate as we locally are because they don't know neighborhoods, they don't know school districts, they just do a broad you know, net that they throw out there and they could be pulling in uh, bank-owned homes and other things that would affect those numbers. Where after we've seen the condition of your house and the upgrades and things, we can give you a more accurate assessment of what it's worth. Might assess it higher, or would you assess it lower? I mean, nine times out of ten, would you, I'm just kind of getting a feel. <laughs> um, I, I really couldn't tell you until I would see it, because what I always tell people is, let me come over and give you the good news and the bad news. You know, and, and once I've seen it, and once I've done the market study, I can tell you, Zillow may at times say it's worth more. Uh, a lot of times we're we're finding that, that they're saying it's probably worth a little bit more than it actually. Is. We listed our house two years ago. We came in second four times to foreclosure. Uh... Um, the foreclosure inventory is low as well. Uh, we know there's a, a shadow inventory out there where a lot of the banks sort of have held some things back because they were getting bad press about foreclosing and throwing all these houses out there. So they got a little smarter. And because the market, the inventory is low, investors are snatching up bank loans really fast. So if they're priced right, they don't stick around long. That answers your question. Anybody else? Again, feel free to come up and talk to us later if you have any more questions. Okay, I'm not Kathy Smolinski, I'm Sally Bulgarelli. 
and it's Bulgarelli, it's in bull, so it's easier for you to remember. Um, I'm also an agent with Berkshire Hathaway. We all work together. Kathy and I work in the same office, as you can tell, by our matching apparel. Um, we complement each other quite well. Um, these are some sample exterior things you need to do to your home to get it ready for sale. I also have a handout here that I'll go over in a little more detail. First of all, make sure the house is power washed. If at all possible, if it's going to make the siding fall off, don't do it. That's not a good idea. But make sure it's very clean. As far as painting, yeah, if you have peeling paint on the exterior of your house, by all means, fix that. And I don't mean going over the patched parts and just putting a little swab of paint on there because that doesn't work. It doesn't work on the interior. It doesn't work on the exterior. You have to at least do the whole board and, you know, just make sure there's nothing peeling. And for one reason, um, when there's inspections on the house, particularly if it's a VA or FHA loan, if the paint's peeling, it's going to have to be fixed. And if you don't fix it when the weather's nice, in January you're going to have an offer and you're going to be out there painting a house where the paint's going to literally fall off and may not still be up by the time they reinspect the house. So make sure you do that. Windows and screens, if they're broken or missing, it's pretty obvious. You need to repair them. If your dog has clawed a little hole in the back screen of your door wall, not that I would have anything like that, you might want to have that replaced. Don't, you know, crochet a little doily over it because it doesn't work. Um, the roof. Roofs are very important in selling. Make sure your roof's in good condition. If it's older than 14, 15 years old, it could dissuade a buyer from buying the house. You can buy home warranties for your home to offer to a buyer, which are a real good incentive, but they don't cover roofs. So that's something an inspector may point out. If you decide not to have your house re-roofed, you might want to be prepared to bargain with a buyer when they make an offer on the house and have their own inspector on it. Just be prepared that they might ask you for some money or reduce the price of your home. Gutters, pretty obvious. Um, make sure they don't drain towards the house so you don't have water going into your basement so it's sloped appropriately. In your yard, make sure it's always mowed, trim around the sidewalks. That goes into my little handout here, too. Dead or bare spots, seed them, throw some seed over them. If there's not time for the seed to grow up, put the little stakes and the little string around it so it looks like at least you're trying. And make sure your fence is in good condition. If it's falling over and if it's in really bad shape, you might be better off taking it out, but ask your listing realtor what their opinion is on it and they'll be able to tell you. Sometimes you can buy, if it's a wooden stockade fence, you can buy two pieces for 25 bucks a piece at Lowe's and Menards, put them back up. It's better than putting up um, a piece that's rotted or falling over. The most important thing about selling your house I think is the exterior because if you can't get them inside they can't see how wonderful your house is. You want to make sure your front door is very welcoming. It might require a coat of paint. You might want to replace it for about $200. You can get a nice steel door with a baked on finish. Um, your shutters and trim, same thing. Make sure they're all at least painted. If the trim around the doors is wood and it's starting to like separate, if you can't afford to have it redone, patch it and paint it, but make sure you do a good job on it. People are very critical. People might live in a house like that right now, but if they're buying yours, they want it to be perfect. Trim your shrubs and remove overgrown foliage. You don't want anything interfering with the people going up the driveway or into any of your doors. So if you have a beautiful clematis climbing a trellis and it's spilling over onto the sidewalk, they're going to have to walk around it to circumvent it. You don't want them to do that. You want to make easy access to it. If you have some shrubs that are partially on the sidewalk, trim them back. It's all subliminal, but it makes a big difference to the buyer. Remove on the handout sheet, I have a word that everybody I've shown this to says, what is that? Tchotchkes. If you have the singing frog or the gnomes or things like that, remove them. They may be cute, they may be adorable. I have some things on my lawn that I absolutely love. I have a big fairy that I think is beautiful concrete. I would remove it if I were listing my house for sale. You, you want to be neutral but appealing and welcoming and you never know what might just strike the wrong chord with somebody coming in. You want really nice doormats at your 
at every doorway, but particularly your front door. You don't want one of the ones that shred, you know, the little fiber mats. The solid with the scroll work in them, those are very nice rubber. They're about $20, $25. I love doormats that think, say things like, ask not for whom the dog barks, it barks for thee. But you don't want one at your front door. Because if somebody doesn't like dogs, they're not going to like that to begin with. And it also, I have a house listed that hasn't had a dog in it in nine months. And it has leashes hanging in the inside back door because it's an homage, I guess, to the dog. And people come in, and I've had two people say there was a, a dog odor in that house, and there is not. But they assume that there's going to be if they see a mat like that. So don't have something that's really cute. Don't have something that says U of M in case an MSU client comes up to the door. You know, Just saying, um, it does make a difference. Sometimes, yes, they can be picky, picky, picky. Make sure your porch is hosed off and swept at all times, especially in the fall. When you've got leaves coming down, they'll stick to the bottom of your shoes on the outside. Your clients are going to go in. They're going to have to take them off or they're going to trace them through your house. We usually leave little booties by the front door. But be, to be honest with you, if you've got somebody with a bunch of kids, the kids are probably going to run through before they get the booties on. If it's an elderly person, they might not be able to bend over to put the booties on, so make sure that that's off the porch. Also, in this time of year, there's little bugs and birds that nest around, and they tend to, you know, kind of mess up the porches, so just make sure that they're clean. If you're doing flowers around the house and you can maintain them, make sure they're fresh. I am very opposed to fake flowers. I think they look cheap. Um, if you can't have fresh ones on the outside. Now, I think Carol might have something different to say about that, but I think don't have them at all. It's good to have something with color. And if you're occupying the home and you can water them or have a neighbor water them, go ahead and do it. It adds a great pop of color to the house. But if you can't take care of them, no plant's better than a dead plant. And I think no plant's better than a fake plant myself, only because I think sometimes they're very overdone. The little U's that go on each side of a doorway and the planners that are fake that you see a lot of times at Christmas and then people leave them up all year round, those are okay. Those don't look like fake geraniums. Got what I'm saying? Get it, people? I'm on YouTube. I want big responses. Okay. <laughs> if you can make your front porch welcoming, put a chair, a little side table, some cushions on the chairs. You can get them inexpensively too if you don't have them. Make it look so somebody wants to come up and just sit down and look at the neighborhood and see how wonderful it is and relax. In the winter you can't really do that and you don't want it full so that again people can't come to your front door if you have a long very narrow porch. You don't want things you know, all the way up so that if people come up the side stairway that they're going to get in the way. And if you have a chipped mailbox, replace it, or a really worn mailbox. You don't have to spend $100 on it. You can get an inexpensive one, but if it's pretty abused, just put a new one up there. Unfortunately, you can't take the mailbox with you when you move, but these investments will save you money in the long run. If your house is on the market for a shorter length of time, you're saving money because you're not paying the mortgage rates, you're not paying taxes, you're not paying utilities, upkeep. So what you want to do is get that house to sell quickly, and you need to get them to come in the front door. Okay? Any questions? Oh, yay, questions. Yes. <laughs> I have a house that's going up for sale and I have a vinyl fence that leads up to my house. Mm -hmm. um, the vinyl fence received some damage during the winter with the ice storm mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be replaced. It's only a few sections that have damage that you can visibly see currently. Mm -hmm. But the problem is um, the style is no longer available. So what I was thinking, and it's probably incorrect to think that way, but I thought I would give the buyer the option to purchase whatever they like. No, that's perfect. And that's exactly what I would suggest that you do. Okay. Um, you can put in a credit. If right. you have little things you're worried about, like the fence, which isn't necessarily a little thing, I have even at times taken a, a shadow frame and framed gift cards to Lowe's in there 
and a little sign that says buy this house and get these gift cards for your paint, new paint color. But you could do that for a fence too or just make sure your agent writes that into the contract and that will make a huge difference. Okay, good. Okay. Great, thank you. Good thinking. Is there a difference between the yard for out in the country with acreage versus the city? Like, I'm glad I got, you asked that question I because I live out in the country and there's no way in the world I'm mowing five acres. Right. It's just not happening. Yeah, there is. <laughs> there is a big difference. You don't have to maintain it as closely as you would in the city. You do have to kind of look at the neighborhood. You don't want stuff outside again. People tend to leave the rakes and the wheelbarrows and things outside in the summer more in the country, I think, than they do. I'm not trying to be, you know, bigoted, but I live in the country. This is what I see. Um, I would keep the area close to the house, though, as clear as you can. But, you know, don't worry about the whole whatever acreage you have or whatever land you have. It can look like more upkeep to, to people, too. It's like if I have to mow all of this, I'm going to spend my summers on a riding tractor instead of by the lake or whatever. Okay? Any other questions? Yes. Run, run. <laughs> I, I'm going to guess that, because you said eliminate the tchotchkes, but mm -hmm. I'm also concerned about um, play sets and play yards. and I mean, I know like the little toys that you can pick up, the dump trucks and stuff like that, but I'm also looking at the basketball hoops. I don't know where you're putting a six-foot basketball hoop. No, so. you can leave out all the play equipment. That's not a problem and can actually be an asset to a person. And you can, if you want to take it with you, you can write in there or you can put, we'll remove if necessary. Usually people like that. I'm not talking about the toys. I'm talking more about statuary and pink flamingos and ducks with clothes on and things like that. <laughs> but play equipment's perfectly fine. Other questions? Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Smolinski, who will be doing the interior. And I'm here to discuss your interior. And something that she had made reference to, which has to do with pets, which isn't on our printout here, is very important. Most of us have pets, a lot of us don't, but most of us do. And the important thing to remember, when you have pets, the odor from your pets, and we live with our pets, we sometimes don't smell that, but trust me, there are going to be buyers that come in that do not want to smell a pet or does not want to have the dander. So that's number one important thing to look at. Go to Petco, let them know that you have a pet and you'd like to you know, take care of that odor because you're putting the house on the market. They've got all kinds of great, you know, things that you can utilize. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about decluttering your house. And I would recommend take each room at a time because if you've lived there for many, many years, as most people have, you probably accumulated a lot of stuff. So it's important to declutter. And I think Carol will give you some good advice on rule of thumb as to, you know, how much to take off of your counters and so forth. But we as agents can give you some really good advice to get you going, okay? And uh, like I say, take every room at a time and just send it to Goodwill or whatever or, or rent a storage unit. I've had clients rent storage units just to declutter and get rid of stuff. You want to make that house look as large as you possibly can and spacious, okay? Closets, again, you know, you remove the excess in closets, organize them, make them look nice and sharp because you know people are going to snoop in your closets. There's no getting around that. Basements are very, very important. Uh, I think basements play a huge part on selling your home. So you want to really make sure your, your basement is clean and tidy. And if the basement floor needs to be painted, those are things. And especially if you've had any kind of water issues at, at times, you know, get yourself some some stuff to take care of that. As far as the walls, you know, they've got stuff at Lowe's that you can, uh, it's called dry lock. If you've had problems in the past, pick up some dry lock paint, 
<clears throat> and then outside, um, touching on what Sally was talking about, the exterior, it's important to take care of that problem if you did have a water issue. And that's bring that soil up against your, your foundation and also be sure to extend those gutters out. So when you go to inside, get it all set up and painted, that it's gonna be taken care of and you're not gonna have more constant problems interior-wise in your basement, okay? Um, and, and just like your furnace, wipe everything down. And I mean, you know, the cleaner, the more tidy it is, the nicer it's gonna show, obviously, okay? Uh, if you have any maintenance issues at all, it's wise to have them checked out. I always advise my sellers to, if they think their furnace is on its last leg, you know, have it checked out, be proactive. I mean, if you wait, you know, the home inspector's gonna find it, he's gonna point it out, and then that other agent's gonna ask for a new furnace. So it's good to kind of have your ducks in a row if you've got someone that can look at those things, your roof, you know, those kinds of things, your big ticket items, your your roof, your furnace, and, and your electrical is your big ticket items, okay? So, especially electric on the inside, you know, make sure your electrical is all up to par for your own safety, okay? And, uh, you know, there's gonna be spaces in your home. I know a lot of people have spaces that you can't get to because they've got so much stuff in front of that door. They've never used the upstairs. You know, get that cleared out so people can See your whole home, okay? And when we're talking about painting, remodeling, we as agents can give you some great advice. Um, we're not we're not people like our next gal that's going to come up and and talk who can really give you some great advice on that. But we do know enough as far as agents go, where we can give you some good guidance, okay? Like, yeah. I would recommend you do this and this, and of course we would recommend Carol Morgan to come in and if you wanted to stage your home a little more professionally, she'd be the gal to do it. But we do have some great ideas and we can surely guide you as far as placement of your furniture, things like that, you'd be amazed. I've helped clients you know, actually move furniture, we'd be moving furniture, but guess what? We would have it set so it appeared larger and it looked lovely. And not that the way it was set was, was bad, it was comfortable for the seller, but we want to stage it to sell. So, any questions I can answer for you? In regards to paint, um, right now we've got pictures on the wall that are personal photos. We plan on taking those down before we um, list the house, but that means that there probably are fade marks so with the pictures up, the paint looks great, but should, when we go to put something else there, should we paint beforehand or just write that in where there's an allowance or what would you I recommend? would recommend you paint if it's not a huge endeavor, you know. Um, they say, a lot of people say, take your personal pictures down, just leave a few pictures up. And again, she's gonna give you more advice on that, but I definitely recommend take the personal pictures down. People are nosy. They want to know who are you and you know they they need to be looking at your home, not, you know, your personal items. And again, it is going to open up a can of worms for you, you know. You're going to have to fill in those holes, repaint. Um, and that and again, we as agents can help guide you that way because some depending on your home and your neighborhood is going to really, whether it's going to be worth it to you to do that, and if it's not worth it to you to put 2000 into paint and redoing it, we may say, you're not going to get that out in this neighborhood. Just leave your pictures on the wall. It just, you know, everybody's a little different depending on neighborhood and how much can we get for the house and so forth. So we can give you some great advice when it comes to that. Okay. Any other questions? I guess this is an exterior question. We had, right, sorry, but the painting brought my thought up. We had some younger kids come through our neighborhood. We live out in the country and they spray painted our um, trees bright green. 
So my question to you, should we spray paint over that brown? Or I mean, I don't know what to do with our pine trees. I don't want to cut them down, but I don't. <laughs> No. So, what is your you. what is your Wait a minute. Um, your, your pine trees are painted lime green? The trunks are painted lime green, correct? It, apparently it was a fun thing to do. Apparently. I probably have that. I I get. I'd probably go to Lowe's or Menards and see what kind of paint you can get and fix that. I I just don't think it's going to be attractive in my opinion, but as far as interior, you have any other questions? I can answer. Good. Okay. Uh -huh. Next up is Carol Morgan, and she's from Stage Rights Home Staging. I am. Is this on? Is this working? Okay. Um, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Surprise! I'm going to go up here so I can see better, but while they're fixing that, I just want you to know that we've been around for about seven years. Um, we are a locally owned grassroots company that my husband and I started seven years ago. We currently have four stagers, and we have prepared or assisted um, homeowners in preparing um, 900 homes. So we, we have a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to take, Kathy talked about subliminal. And that's something I want you to keep in the back of your mind when we talk because we're really going to talk about marketing. If you've watched HGTV, forget that. That's not reality. <laughs> Everybody says, oh, you have a really fun job. Yeah, okay. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. Um, I want you to know that you can go to our website. We have some handouts for you. You can go to our website and you can get what's called a ready, set, list, report. And it has detail as it relates to what Kathy and Sally talked to you about in terms of you know, decluttering and how to identify clutter. You know, because I'm kind of thinking some of my stuff isn't clutter, but maybe somebody else would. You know, so helps you to define that. So we have some handouts. We also have some nifty coupons for you that is going to take um, some money off of a, a verbal consultation because we are partners with Berkshire Hathaway. Normally, a verbal consultation with our company is $185, and if you um, pick one of those coupons up today, it'll be $150. Um, so anyway, staging. Staging is primarily about placement and it is about marketing. It has little or an absolutely nothing to do with your style, your taste, or your decor. And the big piece of bad news that I'm going to give you today is you can't change the buyer, you can only change the product. I understand that it's emotional when you're selling your home and you're going, why can't people see the potential? I promise you they can't. Only about 10% of the population has the ability to see beyond. Um, and I understand that it's not always the most fun process. Proper preparation of your home is about maximizing the sales potential. Doesn't matter whether the market's hard or soft. There's always buyers, there's always sellers, okay? You want the most money for that home at that particular time that you are selling. And it is an emotional thing. People come in, it's about ambiance, it's about marketing, it's about telling a compelling story. This is your largest personal investment, so think deeply about what you're going to do. Staging is marketing. So we're going to talk about preparation, presentation, and promotion, or ready, set, list. Okay? So you tell me, which is the most compelling story? Yeah? This right here, isn't it? Coca-Cola is going to sell Coca-Cola. We love Coca-Cola, but we really love Coca-Cola when there's a little boy or a kitten or something. This is marketing. This is getting people excited. And that's what you do when you professionally prepare your home for market. Okay? The real estate industry is changing and correcting itself. The marketing process we used to use is no longer applicable. Things are different. We have different people that are buying houses now. So you say to me, well, I've sold many homes. What has changed? The psychology of the demographic has changed. Buyers want move-in ready. There is more television. There is internet. People are busy. While we used to cast a wide net, now the whole idea behind marketing your home is to cast the perfect lure. Who is going to buy your home? Who is that demographic? Is it an entry-level home? Is it a home that's going to bring in an entire family? Is it a home that likes a little bit of you know, space between them and the neighbor? 
Is it a home that wants, or is it a family that wants an open floor plan and you don't have one? How do you do that? Staging. The top three things that new homeowners have on their wish list from the home game, you guys can check this out. Fresh paint. The number one thing they want. Oh, it's got fresh paint. Cheapest thing you can do yourself, but they love fresh paint, okay? Newer, newer flooring and organized storage. They truly believe that they can live like you when they open your closet and it's perfectly neat and organized with cute little bins. It's, oh, I could live like this, all right? Your target market is most likely, not completely, but most likely younger than you, so you must appeal to that demographic who is going to buy your property. Real estate is retail. Money in, money out. Okay. You have to meet the expectations of your demographic. Now, I did not choose um, vacant properties to show you today. I cho chose properties that people are actually living in and just some little things that you can do. Um, before, this was a very taste-specific home with a crystal chandelier, Queen Anne furniture. I can tell you that's not who was going to buy the house. That is not who did buy the house. Um, this house, we ended up changing out the light fixtures, just brought in some different chairs. It had white brocade sofas. We took those out. Um, we took down the valances. We had Gerbeau valances. It was very formal. Five showings, five offers, sold at top price at $635,000 in Battle Creek. It's a competition. You have to have a plan. 92% of potential buyers view the internet before they call an agent. That's from the National Association of Realtors. Proper preparation gets a property media ready. The very first thing they're going to see is the MLS photograph. You know, they've said, oh, you know what, I want to buy a house. So I want to pay this amount of money. I want this many bedrooms. I want this school district. And these things pop up, right? And then you go through and you go, oh, that's cute, or oh, I don't like that. You want them to go, oh, I've got to see this house. This house right here, we just finished this up. There wasn't a lot wrong with the house, okay? It was all very expensive things. This is an expensive home. We just cleaned it up a little bit. It's about the space. It's not about the collection of stuff that people have used. Go ahead. Preparation. Edit the amount of furniture you have. You are selling space. Clean, clean, clean. I call it mother-in-law worthy. Okay, if your mother-in-law was going to come over and do the house inspection, how clean would it be? Lighten and brighten. Open the drapes. Get the blinds up. Take those heavy valances off. You want to open it up. You want people to be able to breathe. No repairs. Caulk the tub. It's simple. Just caulk it. That's a nice little bead of caulk, okay? Little things, little chips. Go around your baseboard, all those little chips of paint, just touch them up, okay? It looks fresh. Upgrade where you need to. Finishes are important to your buyer, and you have to compete with new construction in some cases. Remove visual clutter. Curb appeal. Don't forget the mailbox. It's the very first thing Kathy or Sally talked about. It. You know, it's listing after this winter, and it looks a little sad and a little tired. Let's get it perky, okay? Spray paint is your friend. Spray paint it if you have to. Garages and basements are important too. I had somebody that had a three-car garage that you couldn't drive into it. They said, Carol, it's the garage. I said, are you selling it with a house? Because it's the same rules are, are applicable. Okay? Return on investment. I'm not going to go through all of this with you right now because I know we're on a little bit of a time crunch. I just want you to know, um, actually, updates to the kitchen is now up to about 80% return on investment. Bathrooms, 100%. Replacing the carpet, 100%. Painting is 100%. Painting the interior, 180% return on investment. And can you put a dollar figure on the marketability? Can you put a dollar figure on being able to move ahead with your life? And, and getting rid of that carrying cost and move on and get that home of your dreams or that new location. That's a, a, a perceived value as well. Presentation. You've got one shot. You don't get them back through if they're not excited the first time around. Okay, so you've got one shot. And you only have got six seconds to do that. Remember, the first place they visit is the MLS, and that's their wish book. 
your first first impression starts there. Placement is the most important piece of the editing process. No furniture backs to the entrance. Do not block windows. Accent the features, fireplace view, open floor plan, closet, half full. Make sure the guest closet has nothing on the floor, there's no vacuum cleaner in it, nothing on the top shelves, nice wooden hangers. The rest is, is, is wonderful from there on out. Storage should be neat and the furthest point from point of entry as possible. It's okay to have storage. People have storage. We have to live our lives. But when I walk down the basement, it shouldn't be right at the base of the steps. It should be at the farthest point of the room. That will pull people all the way through. Remember, the eye looks for a place to rest. The brain will tell it what to do next. I have people say, let's put the house on the market, and if it doesn't sell in a few months, we will think about some of these things that you said, Carol. How do you get them back in? They've already looked on the MLS. They didn't come the first time. Well, my agent's not showing my house. They'd have to be crazy not to show your house. Nobody wants to look at it right now. So we have to put the people in a position where they call BJ or Kathy or Sally and say, hey, I just saw this house on the MLS and I have got to see that house. They want to buy your house. When they go up to the front door, all you have to do if they are there all you have to do is meet their expectations at that point. And Ready, Set, List will tell you how to do that. Be ready for the first go around. This is a vacant, but you can see we changed some color. It's outdated, um, and that's that. <laughs> if the new homeowner, homeowner wants the property changed, they can do that themselves. What if I make changes and the buyer doesn't like them? Really? The wallpaper, it was pink and black, by the way. It's kind of hard to tell here. This is kind of a, a light cream color. Nobody, this entire house had wallpaper like this all the way through it. It was Waverly Hell. It was all over the place, okay? <laughs> okay. And they're not going to make those changes themselves. That's a lot of work for a family home with three kids playing soccer, okay? I have a designer home. My friends love it and say I have a knack. I worked hard to decorate my home. Yes, you did. And we all appreciate that and we love it. But right now we're marketing space. We're not marketing your style or your taste or your decor. Okay, we have to get past that. Once you've made that emotional step away from the house and say it's a commodity, then we can move forward with marketing your home. This particular house is across the street from Lake Michigan. Very traditional on the left, heavy. We had a lot of jeweled colors in the house. Client was in California, actually. We in, and it is a, it's a primary residence rather than a secondary residence, but we still tried to make it beachy and fun and light. Sold right away, it's been on the market two and a half years. Preparation staging is no longer an option. It's a mandatory, mandatory tool that helps maximize your sales potential. Your home is beautiful. Personal items, personal decorating is a distraction. Staging will minimize that possibility so that the property is the center of attention, not your style. Property is a commodity. Preparation may also include minor cosmetic updates, neutral but attractive in nature, that make the product motivating. Oftentimes, a price reduction isn't going to be near as, as um, evoking or, or motivating as a change in fixture or as a change in placement or as a change in paint color. People aren't talking $10,000 when they're talking about, you know, the bright purple bathroom. They just can't get past that or the deer head on the wall. And this is the key. A buyer will pay top dollar for their dream home. They will not pay to fix it up. In this market, buyers look until they find something just right or they keep on looking. Don't give the potential buyer an excuse to, buy, to not buy your property because there's work to do. If they can nestle in, if everything is palatable for them, they can make a few changes, but they ha we have to get them in the door and get them to settle in, okay? They have to love it, and they have to love the view or the yard or the neighborhood. 
and we can't have anything distracting from that. <laughs> a properly staged home spends 78% less time on market, thus reducing your carrying costs. That's from home gain. Vacant properties sell on an average for 15% less. Staging allows you to retain 5 to 20% more home equity of the National Association of Realtors. It's not Carol Murphy's deck. Only 10% of the population has vision. Okay. Promotion. Magazine quality photographs. I think BJ brought it up. You know, this is about designer. This is about design magazine quality photographs. You want people to look on that MLS and go, oh, oh, oh. And, and you guys may disagree with me, but I don't think anybody's ever purchased a home because they had a really nice picture of an electrical panel. <laughs> so let's use those pictures, those photographs, for all the amenities and the beauty of the home. And they have a tremendous photography staff that they use on their photographs, and it's all professionally done. So this was professionally done as well. So. You guys, I tried to hurry. I'm sorry. Um, you guys have any questions, anything you want to play Stump the Stager, we can do that. I can dance. I, I danced when I was younger. Yes. I was kind of surprised to see the statistic that vacant homes take longer to okay. sell. Yeah. Because it almost seems like vacant would be like they can picture their own stuff there, and that's not necessarily true. 90% of the people we have to help, we stage a lot of investment properties which are typically vacant. Um, and what we do is we go in and we just try to sell the space. We don't try to make them look like a model home or like someone lives there. But I'll tell you, vacant properties, actually the rooms look smaller. You know, and we also have to help people understand what the spaces are for, which it should be evident. But I just had one the other day that I'll tell you, it was a little tricky on the family room eating area, the way it was lined up. And until we got a table in there, and actually we ended up angling the table, it didn't make sense until we angled the table. And so people would have gone in and said, ah, how do we use this? I've had tons of um, new construction where the, the, the properties haven't sold. And I've taken a look at, look at it, and the segue and the eating area are just maybe it's a, it's design flaw so we figured out what we need to put there so people can see the use of the space and feel the flow of the house. So vacant properties are, are tough to sell. What else? No other questions? Yeah. What if you took a smaller bedroom and turned that into your closet? Not a permanent closet but like with movable racks and so on and so forth. Um, not good, huh? Need to take this all out and... No, bedrooms have a lot of value. Okay, bedrooms have a lot of value. Um, it, I would have to look at the house, but let's say it's a six-bedroom house. Maybe you could get away with it, but I would probably confer with the agent as well. How are we going to market this home? Um, I'm, I do not recommend turning that third bedroom or even that fourth bedroom into an office. People think if you stage it as an office, unless it's really an office, that it's too small to be a bedroom. And so if they need a four bedroom home, it better look like a four bedroom home. So present it as it is, because you're asking people that don't have imagination to figure out what you meant when you staged it as a closet. Okay, that it's really a bedroom, but we staged it and we put it as a closet. That was a really good question, yes. Kind of to piggyback on that, we've got one bedroom that is also very small. And, um, we were going to take my daughter's crib and turn it into um, the full size bed, but it would that would dwarf the size of the room unless we were going to take out all the furniture and just leave a bed and a side table with a lamp. It would have no dresser, or should we keep it with a crib in it? But then it looks kind of like a baby's room. Well, it's it's the third bedroom, fourth bedroom, fourth bedroom. <laughs> Either or, you. I mean, I stage small bedrooms all the time with a crib. Bottom line is, is it's got to be, but got to be a bedroom, or it has to be empty. It's small, so it needs to be staged. I would do a twin bed and a nightstand and a light. It's the fourth bedroom. They already love the house. That fourth bedroom, that ancillary bedroom, is they're not going to say, "Ooh, you know, they've got a crib in here," or "Ooh, they don't have a dresser in here." They already love the house. 
I'm not interested in selling my house, but it brings up a point about what you said about um, sometimes you have to alter a little bit to uh, to showcase your house. Mm -hmm. And mine, when I have a condo and the dining area, they have a huge chandelier. I say they, it's mine now, but there's a chandelier in it, but you can't put a table under it because there's no room. So what I did is I, I moved the rug and the, the table underneath the archway into the sunroom. It actually works and it looks good, except I've got this sore thumb of a chandelier hanging in a bad place. I talked to an electrician about moving it into the archway, but it's so big, it, it it won't work because it won't reach down. And it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. I don't really want to get rid of it. What would you recommend if I was to sell it to, to do with that? Well, I think you're going to struggle with people having a, a table in an archway. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how many houses that you have a hard time putting the table in because the chandelier isn't where it should be for that. What I recommend, and without seeing it, I'm sorry, it's really, really hard for me, but there's also the option of swagging that lamp. And we looked getting, at that option, too. Look at it, getting more chain on it and swagging it. Yeah, it's just, it's too big. It, it's great because I have really high ceilings, but you put it in that archway, it's... It sits like almost on the Oppressive. table. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's you almost could... like we'd have to remove it and put something completely different in. Maybe. If you want to send me a snapshot of it, you know, I'll do that that one thing complimentary for you. If you'd like to send me on your iPhone, you can pick up my information over here at the table and just okay. send that to me. Just tell me, just remind me who you are. <laughs> thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, I would like to say thank you for attending. I'd also like to remind you. Put my glasses on. That this is going to be on Facebook, so be sure to go back and watch if you have any questions that come out of this. We do have the contacts for you. And I'd also like to remind you that we have two more sessions coming up. One is foreclosures. It's on the 23rd of July. Please, please pass the word to that because we know that there are people here in um, our community that are struggling, and it could be family, it could be friends, it could be yourselves, it could be your coworkers. So spread the word, have them come, and that will be a panel discussion.